Well, welcome today. We are at Bee Buzz episode 23. And if you're one of the folks who doesn't like to hear any of the personal stuff, like I've told you before with the Bee Buzz, that's the only place I'm going to run my mouth and jibber jabber and talk about things that aren't necessarily bee related. But I do try to get that knocked out at the beginning. So hopefully you don't have to put up with it for too long, which I'm trying to find a good balance. So hopefully that works out. So let's go ahead and jump right into some of the personal updates. That's probably going to be about 10 or 15 minutes for those of you who don't want to hear it. Just go ahead and fast forward. All right. Well, I just got back from uh, from Michigan. So it's an annual family get together. That was pretty cool. I, um, I, I, I don't want to brag, but I was crowned the 2024 rock skipping champion. So there was a, a field of about a dozen people in this one. And the age of everybody doesn't matter. Maybe I was the youngest one. No, I wasn't. I wasn't actually the youngest, but I think there's about 12 of us there. And it's a lot of aunts and uncles and nephews and just a lot of good folks. So we had a a pretty good time. The best I've ever done in the past is third place. I did manage to uh, to get number one here for the uh, first time ever. Now, there is a family member who was not there. He's he's the ringer. He's the master. And uh, it's been he and his dad. Are, are taking it home every year pretty much. My nephew took it away one time, and uh, and I had my opportunity where I was able to steal it away this year. So I've got the trophy. I've got all the, the stuff going on with that. You know, I did suffer a, a minor laceration to the foot but because uh, we were doing this from about knee deep in the water at the time of throwing. But sometimes you have to spill a little blood to get things done. Now, for the FBI folks who are listening, I don't mean anything by that. There's no underlying secret message. I'm just talking about rock skipping, not activating a sleeper cell. So uh, what else do we have going on? Oh, and that was up in the like Saginaw Bay area. There is a side bay. I can't remember what it was called. I think it was like Wolf Bay or something like that. Anyway, it's up there near Caseville. Really good time. A lot of fun. And that's that. Also... If you ever find yourself in the Sterling Heights, Utica area of Michigan, there is a ballpark there. It's called Jimmy John's Ballpark. But the kind of cool thing with it is they have four baseball teams that will play there. You have the Utica Unicorns, which I got a chance to see them play. I think it was last Sunday. And they were down three to nothing going into the eighth inning. In the bottom of the eighth, they picked up four runs. Held him in the ninth, had a four to three win, pretty good game. But the Utica Unicorns played there. You have the Birmingham Bloomfield Beavers, who I'm sporting the. You can't really see it because of the the mic there, but sporting the Bloomfield or Birmingham Bloomfield. I can't even talk. Birmingham Bloomfield Beavers shirt right now. East Side Diamond Hoppers and the West Side Woolly Mammoths. So definitely check that out if you are in that area. Okay, so now I want to use you guys as my support group. If you have a cat that has a thyroid issue, we have one. It's the family cat, been around for 12, 13 years. He's got a new diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. This is hyper overactive. He was a perfectly normal little groundhog looking cat, right? He was like a pound or two (coughs) or six overweight. He was a big boy, but everything was fine with him. He's having a good life, no issues. And then he just starts rapidly losing weight getting like really agitated and irritable and constantly eating. We're like, what in the world's going on? So we get him tested, has the hyperthyroidism. And like now he just follows me around like all the time and yells at me. It's like, it's like I'm literally being followed around by like a 90 year old guy with dementia. That's I bring him in to feed him. I'm like, here you go, have something to eat. And he looks at it and goes, no, what else you got? I'm like, come on, man, this is all we got. I get him like four different types of food and he loves it one day, hates it the next. So he's on the pills now and uh, hopefully we'll get him back on track. We did just pick up a couple of sponsors. These are on the podcast side, not the YouTube side. But I figured I would mention them anyway because they they kind of are not too far off of beekeeping, and they're kind of fun and neat. So one of them is Palm Street. So Palm Street sells regular plants, exotics, crafts, crystals. And the reason I'm mentioning it, again, I don't get paid to mention it aside from the commercial space that they have or whatever. I just think it's cool. I fired the app up because I don't want to endorse something or advertise for somebody that doesn't actually have something good. So I went ahead and checked it out, kind of gave them the, the green light to, to move forward with the ads. But the thing that I thought was really cool about it is, you know, you fire up this app and you can see live real time. It's kind of like a live stream that you would do on YouTube or anywhere else. And you can interact with the people selling while they're they're selling. So there you can ask them a question and they'll answer your question. You can see the questions that other people are asking. I think it's really, really kind of cool. 
especially if you're somebody who wants to try, you know, try buying something that you maybe haven't had around your house before or something new or different. And you want to ask them like, hey, I'm in this area. Can I put it outside some of the year? Or is there any special soil acidity or pH requirements? And the people I've seen in there seem to be pretty bright. Some of them are, it's like anything, right? You got different personalities. Some of them are goofy and joke around. Some of them are a little more stoic, but, uh, but I think that's pretty cool. So that's one. The other one, let me reach over here. The other one is Feather Snap. So if you haven't heard of Feather Snap, they are a solar powered bee, uh, video based bee feeder, bee feeder, Jesus. bird feeder, <laughs> solar bee. Feeder. Anyway, they're a solar based bird feeder with a video camera. And the, the camera is actually, uh, I think it's like 1080p. So you get your HD kind of resolution. But the app has the ability to identify like 275 different species of North American birds. They will take pictures and videos of the birds while they're at your feeder. They'll send you notifications if you want. So I have, if you're on video, you're going to be able to see this. If you're not, then you won't. But uh, there it is right there. So the feather snap. It's got all the cool stuff here. So I'm going to be getting this thing fired up here pretty soon. And I'm going to put some of the videos you know, up on the YouTube channel just for people to check out if you're a bird person. I'm like that middle of the road kind of bird person. I have like a whole bunch of birds that fly past my house, like migratory birds, you know, a couple times a year, depending on, you know, what, what time of year it is. We get a lot of like your normal everyday, you know, cardinals and robins and blue jays, crows, all that kind of stuff. But there's, you know, occasionally we get some kind of neat birds that, that pass through. So I'm excited about getting that set up. So now let's go ahead and check in with our podcast stats here. So we are number seven. These are all going to be in the how-to section. Number seven in Greece, number nine in South Africa, number nine in Barbados, and number 14 in Canada. So thank you to the folks up there to the north, our Canadian brothers and sisters, for pushing us a little bit closer to number one up there. Uh, we really we really do need to get that number one back in Barbados there. I felt like that's kind of... Uh, you know, some low hanging fruit for us. So, you know, tell a friend, phone a friend, whatever you got to do. But this is actually a time of year in the podcasting space where a lot of people are outside of their normal podcast listening routines. You have people on vacation, they're traveling. So I typically see about a 20 to 30% hit on the numbers. And that's kind of what it's looking like this year. Not unusual, but no excuses, everybody. We got to, we got to push forward and do better. Well, actually I got to do better. I just, you know, need your help and listening so just keep pressing the play button and just put it on repeat over and over now the one thing i do typically see every year though is around august september i do see a drop off because people who've had problems like you know you get your hive in march or april you're getting everything ramped up and if you've had them swarm if you've had them die out starve lose a queen whatever happens that usually happens by august and then i see that drop off in august september of listenership and then you get around to Usually like December, around December time frame, around right before Christmas, people start coming back in because they're thinking about what they want to ask for for Christmas on their beekeeping wish list for the next year. And then December, January ramps up and then then we get a good a good spring ramp up just like the bees do. So I want to go ahead and jump into just a kind of a general FYI. If you're watching YouTube, which Anybody who's paying attention to beekeeping, I know that you know, you're know you not just watching me, which is good. I don't want you to just listen to me or watch me. There are so many great, amazing beekeepers in this community that will provide different perspectives, different ways of doing things. I'm friends with some of them. I at least casually know most of them. Great people out there. But there is a video I was watching the other day, and there's a guy who is, a, again, a you know real, real rock star in the community, in the beekeeping space. He's a super smart guy, puts out a lot of great content. And I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. So this is in no way a shot or a, you know a hit or a ping or a ding. I don't know. I guess a ding against him. He was doing a video. I was watching the other day, and he was doing a lot of manipulation within the within the hive. So he had everything opened up, and he decided he was pulling one frame out, wanted to move it down below. Another frame was going to be taken out completely and put into a different hive. And then the other frame he took and turned it and faced a different direction. And as he's going through this, I'm thinking like, yep, makes sense. No problem. And then I started thinking about it. You know, if you're a new beekeeper or a prospective new beekeeper, you're thinking about maybe picking it up next year. And then you see that video. You might be a little bit 
overwhelmed. You might think that, geez, I, there, there's way too much going on here. There's no way I'm going to be able to figure this out in my first year of beekeeping. I completely understand, and I get it. What I want you to think about going into year one is just to focus on the basics. I kind of joke around about it all the time. I, I call it the Cro-Magnon approach. But I'm, I've been waiting for somebody who's like a paleontologist to tell me, like, well, technically the Cro-Magnon didn't, you know, but, but the, the Cro-Magnon approach, very simple, very straightforward. You're going to have a box. You're going to put bees in the box. Keep them dry. Keep them warm. Keep them mite free. And everything else will kind of find a way to figure itself out, right? I recognize it's not that simple, but it's really not that far off from there either. As you get more experience, as you continue to work with your mentor, or you're working with me, or you're working with whoever you're working with, you will develop all the skills. You'll develop. It, it is literally like anything else. You know, if, you're, if you were a kid and you ever played like, like T-ball or something, right? You had the ball on the tee because they wanted you to focus on the fundamentals. You know, hit ball with stick, run to base, right? You weren't leading off. Nobody was doing leadoffs in T-ball. You know, you weren't really bunting. You can't bunt from, well, every hit is kind of a bunt anyway in T-ball, but you start with, you build a foundation and you work your way up and beekeeping is going to be the same way. So if you watch those videos and you're seeing a lot of complex activity taking place, don't worry about it. It's going to get better. You'll figure it out later. Just focus on the fundamentals. So I want to take a quick minute and just read a couple of emails that, uh, that came to me recently from my uh, from Virginia State. I'm a member of the Virginia State Beekeeping Association. I also get some from the state apiarist and uh, just a couple things I wanted to read to you real quick that are FYI. Some of them are going to be only applicable if you're in Virginia. Others are going to be applicable no matter where you are. So we'll go. I got three of them here. I want to just jump in real quick and just take a couple of minutes. The first one here, late in 2023, the yellow-legged hornet, YLH, Vespa velutina was found near Savannah, Georgia. This was the first record of YLH in North America. It is a common pest of honeybees in Europe and other continents where it's found. YLH colonies found near an apiary feed almost exclusively on honeybees, consuming nearly 25 pounds of biomass workers per nest each year. While it's not known to occur outside of Georgia and South Carolina at this time, surveys for YLH are being conducted among Atlantic coast states. Late summer and fall are ideal times to survey when YLH colonies reach a peak in population, increasing the potential capture of individuals from a nest. The Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, VDACS, is looking for 100 apiaries to set up and monitor YLH traps. I'm not going to read the whole, the whole thing for you here, but if you have an interest in this, if you are in the, this area and you want to set up a trap, if they haven't already gotten to the 100 or whatever, I'll get you the contact info. Just hit me up on the Discord room or Jeff at Beekeeping for Newbies, N-E-W-B-E-E-S dot com, and we'll get you the info you need for that one. Okay, so the next one is specific and unique to Virginia only. This is an email about the Beehive Distribution Program. I have applied for it, I think, two years in a row. One year I applied the last day. The next year I applied the first day. I was denied both times, so I'm tapping out. I'm not going to apply anymore. But applications for the Beehive Distribution Program will be accepted August 22nd through September 6th of 2024. When the application period opens on August 22nd, a link to the online PDF application will be available on the program webpage. Only applications received online or postmarked during the application period will be accepted for consideration. Recipients of Beehive units will be selected at random from qualifying applications. Applications submitted in a prior year will not be carried forward to this year's program. Individuals must submit an application during the application period to be considered for the random selection. Again, there is more to this. If you're interested or have no idea about it, I think you can just Google, you know, uh, Virginia Beehive Distribution Program. If you have any trouble tracking it down, let me know. I'll get you the info. And last but not least, newly approved Varroa mite controls, e.g. Amiflex, Ezox, Tablets, and Viroxin. Last year, the EPA registered several new Varroa mite control products like Amiflex, Ezox, Tablets, and Viroxin. Each product contains oxalic acid dihydrate for controlling Varroa mite populations in beehives. Amiflex is a restricted use product requiring that the user is a certified pesticide applicator. Easyox tablets allow for easier application of oxalic acid in using a vaporizer. Viroxane is a slow release and longer acting application of oxalic acid in the honeybee colony. These products are registered with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services for distribution, sale, and use in Virginia. Viroxane registration was approved last week by the Office of Pesticide Services. So that's kind of it for that. Just wanted to make that uh, make everybody aware of that. And again, that's going to be like a Virginia thing specifically, but I wanted to get that out.
Okay, so let's get on to the questions here. Question number one, about how many frames in the brood boxes will end up honey stores? I have three or four that are either almost fully capped on each side or at least filled with honey or nectar. So the generic answer I gave was six to 12. And that answer is really generic because I don't know how, you know, what was the size of the colony going into the fall flow? How rich was the fall flow? Was it a really, really uh, robust? Did the bees bring in a lot of nectar and pollen? And, and did they suck away a lot of new resources? For me, what I've seen typically is the fall flow for me is about, 25 to 40 percent of the spring flow so it's not that much but how much of the, the brood space actually becomes nectar it's, it's definitely going to or, or honey is definitely going to vary year by year colony by colony you can have you know six colonies in the same apiary in the same place in your backyard and they all you know have different numbers just depending on their genetics and how they are so like i said it, it could be a few, it could only be a few, and most of it could all be kept above, and it could be kind of balanced 50-50. So it's going to be, again, pretty variable. The next question was, when you say a frame, do you mean like a side or both sides of the frame? So whenever I say grab a frame of brood, I generally mean grab a frame that has brood on both sides. Now, even in that example, there are a lot of different ways you can go with that. So I'll, I'll explain that kind of further. If I have a two-frame nuke, these two-frame nukes are great. I mean, you can grab a frame of brood, even if it's only one half, right? So one half is completely packed with brood. The other half, it's going to have something on it, but maybe it has not been fully drawn out yet. You take that and put that into a small two-frame nuke with a queen cell. That is a great way to establish a new colony. Now, on the flip side to that, if you had both of those frames completely packed out, as that brood is emerging, you're going to have an explosion of new nurse bees who are going to be available to start caring for the new eggs, the new larvae that are being raised within that colony. So, when, again, whenever I say a frame, I'm talking about full, you know, both sides. All right, next question here. Is it possible to give the bees too much space over winter? I know they'll cluster to keep warm, but wasn't sure if too much space would give you unwanted visitors or cause any other temperature humidity issues. I have two deeps and three supers on. So the answer I gave is you really don't want too much void space. I'd say as an example, if you had two packed deeps, two full mediums and one partial medium, I would harvest the partial or at least pull it off and put it in the freezer. Void spaces leave room for a mouse if they can sneak in. It's more space to heat. This is kind of the bigger issue that I've seen. It's, a, it's more space for the bees to heat during the winter. If you don't have enough bees to be monitoring all the resources, that opens up the possibilities for other pests to get into those resources and do some damage, sometimes completely unimpeded. So that, again, like I said, that's the big issue that I've seen is just they have this huge cavity and they've got to heat the whole thing, and that causes them to have to consume more resources. So you, you really don't want to do that. They will use every space inside the hive. So when you think about you know a frame, and the frame is loaded with cells, they will crawl inside individual cells as part of the cluster. So they're going to make use of everything that they have. Okay, next question. I've been wanting to mite check my bees, but with everything still rolling hard, like there's not a dearth on, should I wait until the fall flow and the pollen stops. I would say absolutely not. Figure out a routine that works for you. You know, and I've I've kind of been a little bit in different um, places with this. Or I used to have kind of a schedule that I ran off of because when I was managing just a few hives, it was really easy to just kind of be on a schedule and just treat when you wanted, and just it kind of wasn't a big deal. As things grew in my apiary, and you had to be much more efficient, you had to kind of create schedules and stick to those. And it just, it was more structured. So what I would recommend is pick something that is based on your past as you start documenting and creating your own sort of journal of everything that you're doing. So basically, if you just said, I'm going to do an inspection every month, or I'm going to do a mite wash every month. And then you realize, let's say that it's May and you do a mite wash and you're at five or six per hundred. And you're like, oh, wow, I need to do something about this. I, I got to go ahead and treat. So you get your treatment plan in place and you do everything. Well, when the treatment is done, you're going to want to do a mite wash again. You need to see if your treatment, if your intervention was effective. So, you, so the only way to know is to check again. So maybe you treated in early May. You finished all the treatments by mid, mid to late May. Well, one June rolls around. Let's go ahead and check again. 
Oh, the numbers look good. Okay, so maybe you won't have to treat in the month of June. If you check again, 1 August, uh uh-oh, the numbers got a little out of control. You're going to treat again. So you really got to stay on top of that. And the two times a year that I think that, for me, that are, are the big focal points is the fall is really critically important because you're going to put those bees away for the winter and you're not going to see them again. I mean, yes, they'll be flying a little bit. If you're in a warmer climate like I am or if you're down the south, they'll be flying quite a bit throughout the winter. But in a lot of places, you put them away in September, October, you don't see them again until March, April. So you want to make sure that they go into that overwintering cluster as healthy as they can possibly be. So the fall is critically, critically important for making sure you have those mite numbers basically as close to nothing as possible. Second most important time is the spring. The colony is ramping up in the spring, and they're going to be trying to get as much brood reared as they can in the shortest amount of time so that they can get as much of that forage and that nectar and that flow into their hive and get them prepped up for, again, in the spring, they're prepping for the winter, right? So you want to get them as healthy as possible in that springtime so that they can be able to be really, really effective at what they got to do in the spring. Now, I do have kind of another thing that's nice is we have a, with our dearth, there is a break in the brood cycle. So remember that varroa mites are going to reproduce inside the brood. So if, you, if they're not rearing any brood, if the colony is not raising any new bees, then basically the mites are just kind of hanging out waiting. And that's a great opportunity to treat then when there's no brood inside the hive. So the question came through, it says, what do you guys use to measure your oxalic acid? Now, I'm assuming, I don't remember off the top of my head, I'm assuming that this was a um, for crystallized oxalic acid to be used in a vaporizer. Now, I have the, um, I, I can never remember the name of this thing. It's the Lores, Lores, whatever it is. It's the vaporizer. It's about 400 and some dollars. I'll put a link to it in the description. But that has like a plunger on it and the plunger has like a twisting thing that you can kind of screw it and it changes the level up and down between like one and three grams. Typically you want to do one gram per brood box. So if you have a nuke, you would do a half a gram. But when you adjust that by, by screwing the plunger in or out, you can see the numbers on the side of it. And let's say, for example, you had a double deep, you just turn it until it gets the level down to the number two, that gets you two grams. I stick that thing right into the bag of oxalic acid, scoop up the crystals till it's topped off. And then right before I go to administer it, I drop it in. Because if you put it in ahead of time, and I completely forgot about this, I hadn't done, I hadn't used this thing in a while. And I just kind of popped it in once I was getting ready to go do a treatment. And I forgot that, of course, gravity is going to let a lot of it fall down. And as soon as I did, it starts spraying the vapor out before I was even ready. So hold that vertically with the, you know, the oxalic acid uh, facing up until you're ready to, you know, insert it into the hive and start doing your vapor treatment. But if you don't have that, I'm pretty sure, if memory serves me correctly, it's one quarter teaspoon. One quarter teaspoon is equal to one gram of oxalic acid. Okay, so the next question. Good evening, everyone. I'm wanting to do an alcohol wash to do a mite check. Can someone give me an idea of what I need to do? So I went ahead and posted in the Discord room three different ways that are kind of the more popular ways of doing things. I don't like two of them, but I'll go ahead and kind of explain to you what I did here. Now, on an unrelated but sort of related subject, I did a test today for a master beekeeper program. I decided finally just to suck it up and just go get the certification. So there's a way to bypass the apprentice level through this one program, and I did their test. And for whatever reason, like these guys love the sticky board. They love the IPM board. So this is basically like your yard sign kind of thing, like your election signs or like your, you know, Joe's tree service, the kind of things that you see all the time. They use that type of material, but with a grid system on it. So like zero through 10 across the bottom, zero through 10 across the top. And then you can kind of count like, you know, how many mites per square inch or whatever. I have not used this in years. I tried it like the very first year. I was like, oh, cool. It comes with this little IPM board. Why not? And then I tried it, and I was like, okay, well, that's some numbers that are there. It's like, okay, what do I do with this? And then when I did it again, the numbers were completely different. But yet when I did an alcohol wash, the numbers were pretty good. Like, they were consistent. So it might be that I just completely did it the wrong way, and I'm an idiot, and I completely dropped the ball or whatever. But there is nothing that anybody's going to say. There's like two hills in beekeeping that I'm going to die on. There's the granulated sugar hill. Like, I'm not going to put granulated sugar in a beehive. I'm not doing it. It's not going to happen. You can't convince me. 
And then the other one is this IPM board, sticky board kind of thing. Because what has you got to convince me of how these mites, let's just assume you have two deeps and a medium. And let's say there's some brood in the upper medium and you've got, uh, you, you do a treatment of whatever type. And now all of a sudden you have these mites that are letting go right there. They've got oxalic acid is kind of crystallized on the bees and the mites are like, I can't hold on anymore. I got to let go. And now they're going to just fall all the way through all the bees and the comb and all the stuff that's there. And they're going to land and then they go through the screen and then they land on this board. And that's an accurate number. I don't know, man, you're not going to convince me. So if that's what you want to do, by all means, have at it. I'm not a huge fan. So the next option that a lot of people will go to is the sugar shake. And the reason the sugar shake is pretty popular is because it doesn't kill the bees, right? And I'm doing air quotes here for those of you listening on the podcast. It doesn't kill the bees. Well, maybe not, but I mean, you're going to give them a concussion, brain damage, like shaking bee syndrome, because you have to shake the crap out of them, right? You're going to take this powdered sugar and you're going to put a sample of bees in the powdered sugar, shake the crap out of them, and then like open it back up and you're like, oh, isn't it cute? The bees are still alive. Yay. And like they can't say their own name anymore and they don't know which hive they live in. And, and you know, they're it's just I don't I'm not a big fan of that one either. Like nobody wants to kill the bees if they don't have to. But, you know, quick, fast death with alcohol wash or, you know, long, slow brain damage death from shaking them with the sugar. I just just kill them. You know, just go ahead and do the, the um, go ahead and do the mite wash with alcohol and you're done. But if you want to go the sugar shake method, again, it's the same thing where you would have some kind of a strainer. You shake the sugar through and you look down and you can see, OK, there's X amount of mites that are per hundred. And then you, you, take, you, know, you take appropriate action from that. But the option I usually go with is, uh, is the mite wash. So you want to get your 70 percent or better isopropyl alcohol, put that into a container. I just ordered some of these containers. I got them from AliExpress for like four bucks a piece. And... Uh, I can't remember the brand of them. I mean, it doesn't even matter. It's all pretty generic, but they're about $4 a piece. I got like 10 of them, but it's uh, essentially like a, a, a strainer. So you have a compartment that has a basket. And then as you're shaking, you know, the heck out of these bees to get the mites off, the mites will fall through and all you'll be left with is just the dead bees in the basket, basically. So it, this is one of those, as far as how many mites you should find in that wash, it's kind of a moving target depending on who you talk to. I like to target that less than three. So if I'm at like two per hundred, I'm feeling, you know, okay, depending on the time of year. If it's above three, like three or higher, I'm like, okay, we got to treat. But you, you just got to keep an eye on them no matter what method you go with. So again, you got the IPM board, you got the sugar shake, you got the mite wash. Those are the three most popular. After you finish an intervention, right, whether you're treating for anything, whether you're treating for nosema or you're treating for something else, whenever you do some kind of an intervention, Always have a plan of how you're going to assess the effectiveness of that treatment down the road. So again, if you're treating for Varroa, do a mite wash. If you're treating for something else, take some of your bees and maybe have them sent in for testing to find out you know, if that treatment was in fact effective. And another thing to keep in mind too is, again, a lot of people, and I, and I completely get it, I love my bees too, but a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to kill, you know, half a cup or 300, roughly 300 bees. I don't want to kill that many of them. I feel bad about it. Just remember, a good, healthy queen is going to lay somewhere in that 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day. So you're losing, you know, 25% of your bees, maybe, you know, 20, 25% of your bees for one day. And, you know, they're taking one for the team, right? What they're sacrificing is for the better good of the rest of the colony. So the next question I have is, do you recommend treating for Varroa and SHB, small hive beetle, at the same time? I haven't seen worms on frames, but they are present. Saw larvae in trays and then a single beetle crawling on a tray a few days later. So when they're talking about a tray, this is something that I don't use myself, but it's, uh, it's kind of a cool thing. It's very common, but people will take a tray and put that beneath the like a screened bottom board so things that fall through you know that would normally just end up you know landing on the ground outside you can have it kind of get caught by this tray and uh, somebody else told me about this and I think I had heard about it years ago and forgot about it but somebody down in Alabama recently reminded me about this but what you can do is take diatomaceous earth also called just generically like DE you can put DE in that tray and then as larvae or beetles get into that DE it kills them and kind of takes them out 
But at least having that tray down there gives you the ability to see, you know, what's coming through the screen and, and kind of give you kind of a better handle on some of what might be taking place in the hive. But to answer the question, do I recommend treating for them at the same time? Absolutely. So for high beetle, if you're using your shbtrap.com traps or your, you know, oil traps or peppermint or Swiffer pads or whatever those towels are that I think I mentioned in my small high beetle episode a couple episodes back, whatever you're using to treat for a small high beetle, put that in there and absolutely do your Varroa treatments at the same time. They won't impact each other. Well, folks, that is all that I have for you today. It didn't run quite as long as I thought it would. So I think we, we ran through things pretty quickly here. But, uh, you know, I would ask, you know, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the world, man. There's people rioting. There's bad weather related things. You know, you've got uh, just all kinds of stuff. So what I would ask is, you know, just pray for the politicians and the elites in this world that they can kind of get their heads and their backsides kind of wired together here and, and hopefully... Uh, do something about this quest and this thirst they have for war, man. We got to get out of the business of war because uh, it's just, it's no good. And, uh, you know, we don't want to get into another cycle, another generation of all this crap that's been going on for a long time. So pray for those folks. And like I always say, take care of yourselves, be kind to one another. And remember, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Take care.